All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Autism Awareness Month, day 29. So all month I've been sharing my perspective and tips on autism, but today is going to be kind of different since we're getting close to wrapping up. Tomorrow's the last day, and today we want to talk about autism from Dad's perspective. And I want to first salute you and, and appreciate you and celebrate you and all of those things because... You said you were going to do something, you stuck to it, you really put out a post every day this month, and all of them were heartfelt posts and things that people could relate to, things that people could, could find comfort in and just know that, you know, it's, we're all in this together right. no, matter, no matter what's going on. All right, well, thank you. I appreciate that. No problem. Okay, so the first question is, what were your feelings when we found out? that LJ um, was diagnosed with autism? I really didn't have any feelings. Uh, there was no, it wasn't, wasn't any way or the other. And I think it's because I'd already familiar, like I already knew him, you know what I mean? Like if, if they give you this diagnosis at birth, then you're like, you don't know what your child's gonna be like. You don't know what's, what's going to happen. You don't know what to expect. By the time we got the diagnosis, I already knew what to expect out of him. I had already suspected something was not absolutely correct or was not all the way right in the beginning anyway. And it, 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 didn't, it didn't bother me one way or another because I knew that I was his father. Nothing was going to change that. And he was, I mean, we're going to be with him and support him through anything he goes through anyway. So he just needs a little bit more support. And I guess like my background, obviously, you know, I got sports background and IT background. It's very, with those two backgrounds, it's very easy to accept that somebody can't do what you can do, but they're still just as important, if not more than more important than you to the team, because a team is made up of a lot of moving parts or what have you. So let's say if, you, if we're playing baseball, you may not have somebody that can throw 90 miles an hour or 95 miles an hour, but I can cover the entire outfield, uh, cover all center field, and I can catch. Or you may have somebody that can't catch as well, but they're very good at batting. So, you know, everybody has their part to play, and I look at it like that. Same thing with IT. Uh, you got some people not as good as are not as good with networking, but they're very good with desktop support. So everybody has their part to play. So it right. did not bother me one, one iota just because I feel like those things help. Okay, so being that you just mentioned sports so with lj being your your only child your your son your firstborn and carrying the name junior how do you feel about sports when you look about look at those father and son moments does it make you feel any different about some things that you might not be able to do with lj or how do you feel about that does it change I, or i would be lying if i said that i feel like some of those moments I may not be able to have, mm -hmm. but we'll have other moments. So while I won't be able to, let's say, well, I, he may not play football anyway, just because, I mean, I play football, but I don't know if I would allow him to play football regardless right, of what right. the situation was. But, you know, I may not be able to see him get a big hit or get a sack or catch, a, catch an interception, catch a touchdown or something like that. Um, but we can play catch. You know, so instead of looking at the things that he's not able to do, I'm, I'm thinking of more in 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 regards of maximizing the things that we are able to do. He can catch. He's come a long way with that. Mm -hmm. He can run. Yes. He's come a long way with that. He can <laughs> jump. Uh, he can shoot the basketball now. He, he wasn't able to do that. So he's surprising me every day with the things that he's able to do. And he's been, so I can't say what we won't be able to do. Um, and I don't feel like I've been robbed of any of those father and son moments just because of the fact that he is the way that he is. I mean, he's the way that he's supposed to be. And so instead of looking at what we don't have, I just look at what we do have. Mm. Um, how many father and sons have built a computer together right. at this age? Right. How many father and sons can, can go back and forth? I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of them, but you know, we just, we concentrate on what we can do. Right. Um, Capitalizing off of what he, right? Yes, like his his his, his a, interest, he, right? His interest because like he's a walking memory bank, so we can go back and forth with movie lines. We can do all those types of things, like anything that he's seen, he remembers. Um, just just all types of things. So we just capitalize on those things. I don't really worry about what we can't do, but 
what about the uh, things that you participate in, like with the Taekwondo, the swimming, the soccer, and oh, that was awesome. all of that? Taekwondo was awesome. That's swimming right. was awesome. He took the swimming mm -hmm. way, way more quickly than I thought he would. Yes. Um, the first year was challenging mm -hmm. with, with swimming, but the second year, when he no longer had a, like he had a small fear of water when he was coming. I, I'm not even going to say small. It was, it was, it a was huge an fear. fear. <laughs> I, had to, I had to hold him in the shower, like. And, you know, and then all of a sudden he just got over it because, you know, continuing to to scale, scale those things up, he became more comfortable with them. When he became comfortable with the water, he swam like a fish. It's like like stuff like that. He surprises you every day. Mm -hmm. So you can't really say what his limits are going to be. So we don't know if he goes. Hey, maybe maybe he will. By the time he's in high school, be dunking on somebody. Or we'll be playing basketball together. But I know one thing we definitely will be doing. What's that? We will be lifting weights. <laughs> because he already tries to do it right now. <laughs> okay, so this next question is uh, kind of deep. Okay. And it's going to go into probably two questions together. Okay. Uh, it is, what are some fears that you have for LJ? And as he gets older, what fears do you have with him um, being diagnosed with autism and may one day have to face the police if he's at a point where he's more independent and have a life of his, you know, own? All right, so we'll go with the, the first fear is the fear that every parent has with their child. There's, it's absolutely no different that one day he will be in a situation where I cannot protect him mm -hmm. or advise him properly and that someone is going to take advantage of him or that something is going to happen and I feel like if I had been there, it wouldn't have. Mm -hmm. But that's no different than any other parent, period. Right. Like, I feel like there, I have to work with him more to not trust people so easily because he he doesn't care. Yeah. He just loves people. He's a people person and, and all of that. And I mean, now we, you and I are the same way. Mm -hmm. um, you get you get my respect and my trust right off the bat until you prove otherwise. And LJ's the same way. Uh, probably to, you know, a, a way a way deeper extent but um but it, it, it really just feels like that's <laughs> he wants to get it on the video now but it really feels like that that's it that's the only thing that really uh bothers me but like i said same thing that, that all parents go through will he be able to will he be able to make the right decisions when I'm no longer around. Right. And I mean, like I said, that's that's what every parent goes through. That's every parent's fear that he's going to be in a situation and I, I feel like if I had been there, it wouldn't have happened. Number two, if he's ever, if he gets to the point of independence where he's driving by himself, living by himself, you know, probably in, even if it's in a supervised capacity or if it's assisted capacity or, or if it's all by himself, if he gets pulled over by the police, every, hey, look, it, it is what it is. Every black man's worst fear. Person mm -hmm. of color, yeah, or person of not color, just just doesn't matter. Everybody, nobody wants to get pulled over by the police, and you don't really know why they pulled you over. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if you're a color or not. But the thing with him is, it's an extreme fear of mine that he won't know how to respond, how to react, and they may take some of the ways that he has where he's jittery or. Or he just has to move in certain situations. Mm -hmm. They'll take that as nervousness. They'll take that as, as, um, as aggressiveness, or like he's nervous. He 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 has to be trying to hide something. And so, with that, I'm hoping that the only thing I, I, I'm hoping that it never happens. But you have word, to we, we have we to prepare. In, you have yeah. to prepare. You, you prepare for the worst. Because there's been cases yes, prepare, out there. You prepare for the worst. Yeah. And you, uh, you, you know, you hope for the best, prepare for the worst. There's already been a case, like you said, where there was a uh, there was a fellow, his caretaker was with him, and um, they were laying on the ground. They were laying on the ground with their hands up. The the child had the child was autistic. Oh, uh, it was a grown man, but he was autistic. He was playing with a car, mm -hmm. and uh, they thought it was a gun. They're laying on the ground with their hands up, and his caretaker or supervisor, I don't know what it might have been his teacher or what have he still got shot. Yeah. Laying on the ground with his hands up. And so we know that those things can happen. So, you know, the only I'm hoping that if he gets to that level of independence, I'm gonna teach him the same thing like DL Hughley said he taught his child was get get stopped, get the policeman's attention, and let him know I am autistic, I'm I'm not disrespecting you. I may not understand exactly what you're trying to tell me the way that you're trying to explain it to me. But if you grab my cell phone, you can call my father and he will 
he'll do anything and he'll be on the way and he can he can kind of not translate but you know he can kind of mitigate mediate the situation for us mm -hmm. and so that, that would, i think that will probably be best case scenario if they don't allow that they'll eventually call us and and you know i mean hopefully he's not in a situation where we got to go down there and raise all types of cane but i already know you so <laughs> it, it is what it is okay so how have you viewed lj's progress over the past five years it's been astronomical i probably say the last three years or, or when he was three you didn't know what to expect i mean he was doing the things that a three-year-old should do he was doing the things that a one-year-old should do a two-year-old he was ahead for that he was reading he could um his writing it just now came along but he was always he was reading what two two and a half something like that yeah about like two, two could, and a half you could see words put them together and put the put the phonics together and all of that stuff so he's been reading uh so he was ahead when he was three and then the social part mm -hmm. kind of fell fell behind a little bit once he got to five though things started to take off and i think the last three years of growth have been like like light years ahead you know beyond where he was when he was five He's opened up a lot more socially. He's talking to people. He's He wants to interact with people and play with people. He used to not want to do anything but cling to you and I. But right. now he wants to go play with people. He tells children, hi. He wants to go introduce himself. If somebody's having a bad day, he wants to go console them and consult them and say, it's going to be okay, you know, he, he you know all that stuff. So he's made great strides in the last three, three or so years. Okay. And um, oh, uh, let the people know about your perspective about how important early in, early intervention is. Early intervention is, I feel like, is everything. You're not doing anybody. You're only doing yourself and your child a disservice by denying it. There's nothing wrong if something happens and your child is not quote unquote neurotypical. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that you did. There's nothing wrong with you. A lot of people try to keep it to themselves because I don't want anybody to think it's anything wrong. There ain't nothing wrong with me. Ain't nothing wrong with you. It's, it's nothing wrong with him. He's just a little bit different than everybody. Early intervention is everything. You're doing your child a disservice or whomever a disservice by not getting them the help that they need. It's just like what I say all the time. It's like one of my old adages. You're not going to get better at something by not doing it. You have to get the early intervention. You know, as soon as you see it or as soon as you recognize what's going on, at least get them seen, get them tested, and then you can get on type some type of program. We, you are not, not in favor of... of medication and all types of things like that but that may be necessary in some situations it was not the case for us but hey if, if, if that's the case for for you you're not doing them any help by not getting them the help that they need and i'm not i'm not a a, a doctor i'm not a, a um psychologist psychiatrist i'm not a therapist i'm not any of that so i'm not going to be able to give him all of the help that he needs right you know, it, it's going to say, I mean, more than enough, it takes a village. Yes. To be honest. It definitely takes a village. Okay. So what do you want just other people just to know about autism um, overall? Like when you probably see someone maybe at the grocery store and it may seem like their child might be maybe unruly or whatever. You like, know, you got to stop thinking that everybody's child is bad and, and that we're not, and they're not raising them properly you see a child especially especially if you see a child with the phone in their hand and they got head, and they have headphones on or something like that or they're reacting to the surroundings as if that it's just because they're processing it different mm -hmm. like who's to say that you are not processing something is the right way just because of the way that everybody else processes right it's, it doesn't mean that it's right or wrong or anything he just processes things differently and sometimes they be like you know some people are like Oh, you ought to tell those kids to sit down. Or that. Sometimes they cannot sit out. Sometimes they have to move around. Sometimes they have to interact. Sometimes they have to have pressure on their mm -hmm. arm. Sometimes they have to seek <clears throat> contact from something else. Sometimes they have to move around and, and get the jitters out and get the... And sometimes every, they have meltdowns. Right. Sometimes yeah. they have meltdowns and there's not a lot that you can do about it. Just sometimes, it I mean, clear. sometimes you might be right and, and, and the children are unruly and they do need to be spoken to mm -hmm. and, and they do need some discipline but that's not always the case and because we can't tell the difference between when it's the case and when it's not the case you know the best thing to do is you know just hey i, I look at everything i mean i, I want to say the best thing to do is mind your own business <laughs> but 
if, if it's that, I mean, just look at it like, you know, like those are their parents. They know that child better than you. Um, so, you know, the best thing to do is just let them handle it. Right. If it's not encroaching upon what you're doing, it's not infringing upon, they're not hurting anybody or anything like that. Because it's like, we go to the movies. Sometimes LJ can't deal with some sounds and we have to, yeah, we might go to AMC. He may not be able to deal with a particular sound. He may have to put his uh, hands headphones his, on. His headphones on. We'll he may put his... We'll yeah, we're going to see Onward. Later. Later. He so may I'm he may ready. have to put his headphones or on. Aladdin, he, or Aladdin. Or Aladdin, yes. He may have to put his uh, fingers in his ears, headphones on. He may do the thing where he's trying to drown out the exterior noise by, by doing this and humming like, ah, like, hmm, like that. You never know what they're dealing with. And because we don't know those things, I just, I just think that the bottom line is we all need to be more accepting of others and their possible conditions instead of just being so judgmental right off the bat. You know, get to know somebody, get to see them. I know those signs now, but mm -hmm. before LJ, I, I didn't know those right. signs, but I was always tolerant because I'm, I'm like, it could, that could be the case. So I was always tolerant, but now I know what to look for. And so I can say, oh yeah, well, this is that, or this is that. I can't make an instant diagnosis. I mean, that's not my job, but you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. It, I'm just a lot more, I've always been tolerant, but I think even now more so, I'm, I'm even more tolerant because I know what they could possibly be going through. Okay, so last question. All right. When LJ gets older and he so happens to look back on this video, what do you want him to know? That his father loved him unconditionally. That's it. I mean, that's I love him unconditionally. I don't want him to be another way, and I only want the best for him. That's all. I don't. I, I got no regrets. I, I I I just by the time he sees this and he understands what's going on, I mm -hmm. just want him to know that I hope that he knows how much I love him. That's it. That, that's, that's really it. And how much, you know, I'm looking forward to looking back at this mm -hmm. and him saying, you know what, Dad? You you always have loved and supported me and all that good stuff. And, and hopefully he'll look at it and say, wow, I've always had, you know, parents like this at my, at the ready. So. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dad, for doing this interview. And hopefully, like I said, um, we just wanted to give a dad's perspective because so much you hear, you know, from the mom. So thank you for taking time to do this for us and for the community and everybody else. And that is day 29. Outstanding. And I know I was a little bit long-winded. I'm sorry. <laughs> it happens. She, she's giving me the... the <laughs> the blinks and all that stuff. She's telling me, hey, can you wrap it up? She, the, the wrap it up signal and all that. I'm sorry. I just, I'm passionate about the subject. I'm passionate about my son. And my wife and I, we do the absolute best that we can do to afford him every opportunity and, and everything. But I don't want to come off as... What would you say, like, 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 uh, like what we're doing is like, like a know it all, it. and it's the way, yeah, right? And right. like I've said, this is our experience. This is our experience. So we we're only sharing our experience, right. and every child is different. Every child is different. So you have and to modify. No way. That's the, I mean, you know, if you're doing the best that you can for your child, there's no wrong way. This is just the way that we chose to go, and uh, it works for us. And hopefully, what you're doing is working for you. And if it is, Godspeed to you. All right. Well, thank you so much. Tell All the people right. bye, Jay. Huh? Tell the people bye. Oh, God speak. <laughs>